Bring you up to date. I talked to you about that winter moth, which is a major concern here in the area, and we have a lot of new and good information on the winter moth system. So I talked about this back, I think it was six years ago here. And so the, the, the winter moth is something that uh, defoliates lots of trees, um, particularly apple trees, many kinds of trees. It, winter moth feeds on many kinds of trees, more than almost any kind of tree will be damaged by winter moth. Um, so um, uh, it was first noticed back in 2003. We started getting reports of, of outbreaks of a geometric or inchworm caterpillar north and south of Austin, which we originally assumed it was a native species. We have the Bruce Span worm, um, um, which is a very close relative of, of winter moth. And we have other geometrics like fall cancer worm. We didn't really pay much attention to it because we assumed it was one of those native species. And those species, if they ever have an outbreak, the outbreak subside or collapse very quickly because they have good native biocontrol agents keeping them in check. But this one didn't. It kept on going for several years. And then we started hearing reports of flight at Christmas time. Well, there's no native species that does that, not even Bruce Stanmore. So uh, we figured that well, maybe it's a new invasion, and indeed it is winter moth. It's called a winter moth because it flies in the early winter, as you have seen in your houses. It flies between uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And this was confirmed in 2003, so we uh, then jumped on the system. And uh, so, as I said, it, it deployed, especially like apple trees and maple trees. Uh, that's unlike gypsy moth, it feeds on almost any deciduous tree. And you've seen it, it's an early season defoliator. So, this shows that the, the, the life cycle, the eggs are on these little pink things on the trunks of trees, they overwinter that way. But they hatch just before the buds open, they actually bore into the developing buds. So a lot of the damage happened before the winter moths even uh, before the leaves even open. They're feeding in there, and so little holes become big holes. This, is this tattering kind of damage. The rarity to get complete defoliation is quite different from gypsy moths. Gypsy moths will completely devour our leaf. The winter moths leaves, 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 leaves most most of the damage is, is about 50 to 30 percent, 50 to 30 percent, 80 percent defoliation, but never rarely very complete. Anyway, they, they're done very early. Unlike gypsy moths, which develop through the summer, the winter moths are done in um, uh, uh, mid-May, May 20th, is about, about when they're done, and they drop to the ground, and they go down to the ground, and they spin little cocoons, and that's the pupil stage in winter moths. So they, they stay between the end of May until now. So they've been there for about seven months down in the soil, where they're exposed to predators and that kind of thing, and then the, the adults emerge. So. The, uh, the, the males uh, have wings, but the females, shown here, have no wings. So it's just like the gypsy moth. Both the winter moth and the gypsy moth, the females don't fly. They put all of their energy in egg production, and that's that the males do the flying. That's, so they have high fecundity, about 250 eggs per female. And so uh, we, the first thing we did was survey them with pheromone traps. We started with these, this uh, pheromone traps, shown here on the left. Uh, I hung that strap and then in about 15 minutes took all those males down to kill a male climbing the tree. You know, they come right into the pheromone, which is specific to uh, the winter moth. But unfortunately, unlike gypsy moth, uh, this, this tracks one other species. It's the, uh, the Bruce Span worm is in the same genus as winter moth. So um, we use these pheromone traps to, uh, to survey, but we catch a lot of moths uh, in every trap. And we, then we have to try and tell them apart, and that's not easy. So uh, this shows the female, and then the males of uh, Bruce Span one with the native species, the winter moth, is a, you can't really depend on wind coloration. That's, that's too variable to be reliable. You can uh, dissect the genitalia, but ultimately we went to using DNA analyses, and you, get, you can tell the two species apart very easily. So we did a survey of where the winter moths were and where they weren't. I'm sure I showed this same slide six years ago. The winter moths have been in Nova Scotia since the 1930s, but um, the red and purple ones show where the winter moth is now. It goes from uh, Long Island uh, 
eastern Long Island up along the central Massachusetts, Gulf, Rhode Island, uh, Cape Cod, all of the eastern Massachusetts. And we discovered winter moth on the northern coast of Maine. Our colleagues in Maine have never heard of winter moth. The green is the Bruce Span worm, which we catch everywhere. Anywhere we, we put traps from here to, uh, to Alberta, we catch along the northern interior state, we catch Bruce Span worm. But it's never an outbreak insect. So part of the work we're doing in my lab is figure out, well, what's the difference? Why is Bruce Span worm not an outbreak insect? So I have a graduate student addressing that question. But at any rate, winter moth is, is uh, uh, then uh, the distribution of winter moth matches very closely the, uh, the uh, winter temperature zone, the, the plant cold hardness zone shown here. And uh, so we know the winter moth was in Nova Scotia. And I was very amazed to find out that the Nova Scotia has a very similar winter temperatures that we do. Because that, even though it's far north and has a spruce fir forest, uh, the winter moth are, are have the winter temperatures are very similar to Massachusetts, and right along the coast of Maine, you have this band of uh, warm temperatures associated with uh, being near the water, and that matches the distribution of, of winter moths and uh, very nice. So something about there's something about the coastal conditions that um, are favorable to winter moth, and it's the cold temperatures in New Brunswick or here that kept winter moths from spreading to Nova Scotia from Nova Scotia into the rest of North America until perhaps recently. So one question is, well, does our winter moth come from Nova Scotia? So we're doing DNA and analyses on that. I won't show that to show you that data, but it, it, winter moth, our winter moth is very different from the winter moth uh, in Nova Scotia. It clearly was a second introduction from somewhere in Europe. We're, we're doing a big effort to try and match our winter moth to different populations in Europe, all, all based on males captured in the German country. I've sent these traps to <coughs> worldwide, the colleagues across, across Europe and in Asia, to try and find out where our winter moth comes from based on their DNA. There are a lot of apple trees in Nova Scotia. I'm sorry? A lot of apple trees in Nova Scotia. Yeah, there's an apple trees, but winter moth feeds on almost anything. Maple trees, you know. So, um, in Nova Scotia, and there's apple trees, and there are also patterns, pockets of, of red oak trees and maple trees. So. Um, there's plenty for them to feed on in Nova Scotia. So over the next decade, winter moths spread over the landscape, starting from, north, from the areas in Green, shown North Shore and near Hingham, Massachusetts, down across South, south Shore and Rhode Island and on the Cape Cod. And uh, that, so that happened over the next decade. And um, winter moths have been established uh, twice before in North America, in Nova Scotia and British Columbia. And in both cases, uh, winter moth populations were permanently controlled by introducing the source. So now I'm going to start talking about the, uh, the biocontrol of winter moths. So we have, in Nova Scotia and in British Columbia, they introduced <coughs> two parasitoids. So uh, in um, Nova Scotia, these flies, like these other parasitoids, they, they develop inside the host. So that shows a winter moth pupa developing inside the, the pupa of the winter moth. So that's the winter moth pupa, and that's the fly pupa inside it. And this is the, 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 the parasitic wasp agrophon, which we're not working with, um, this, the, developing inside the winter moth pupa. So this is, this is uh, how these parasites make a living. They kill the pupa, and they, in Nova Scotia and in British Columbia, it was a big biocontrol success. So that story is shown here. So the red line shows a winter moth defoliation back in the 1950s. Uh, so it's very similar to what we have in Massachusetts. The, the foliation goes on and on and on. Um, um, and uh, it, there's basically nothing will keep it in check because there's no virus or anything. The, the foliation goes up and down. So we're, uh, uh, and they introduced the fly, both fly and the, and, and the wasp in 1954 and 1956. And for several years, they saw nothing. And that's exactly what we had, what we've had, experience that we've had. But then the fly took off to starting in around uh, uh, 1959 and reaching a around 50%, 50% parishes in, in 1961. And then the, the, the wasp took off uh, a few years later and it caused the uh, winter moth to collapse in 1962 and it's been a non-pest ever since. So if, if it works in Nova Scotia, it ought to work here. So I jumped right on it when I got the opportunity. So, collection is the importation of this fly. We stayed away from the wasp because the wasp is a taxonomic mess. It's not clear whether it's, it's one species or several species. It's not clear what its host range is. 
The fly, on the other hand, is an absolute specialist. So it's the perfect bioconvergent. It's unlike Comsuro Compliance. It's not going to affect any other species. So that's why we focus our attention on this fly. So how do you put well, um, some of your points about this particular fly. It's, we think it may be a most effective high window morph density because it's unlike most parasites which, which lay their eggs on or in their, their caterpillars. This one lays it on the foliage surface and the caterpillar has to eat the foliage. So it looks, well, flies around looking for defoliated trees. It's a very homage of a specialist. And unless we can get site you news know, and established, winter moth densities are just going to stay at high density from year to year. They go off and down a bit like they, they did in Nova Scotia, but there's nothing, there's nothing like the disease system that operates in gypsy moth. This, this system has no important diseases, and so it's basically a permanent outbreak phase. So how do you collect the fly? Well, you collect it in, in, by collecting the parasitized caterpillar. We, we, we first went to Nova Scotia, but the densities of winter moth were so low you can't find enough winter moth caterpillars to collect. So you took the caterpillars and they had the, the immature fly inside them. What well, we have a colleague who's in the office out in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, <coughs> Vancouver Island. You can see the pattering of the leaves. For whatever reason, the winter moth densities are, are they're way down from what they used to be before they introduced the fly, but there's still enough you can go out there and collect a reasonable number of caterpillars. You've got to do this kind of thing on a large scale to make it work because uh, unless you reach a, a large number of flies. So uh, every, every year for the past uh, five or seven years, uh, uh, I've been hiring a crew of people out on Vancouver Island, and they go around and collect uh, winter moth caterpillars like crazy, and about 50% of those caterpillars have the fly inside them. So, the fly, the, so uh, they beat the, fly, the, the branches of the apple trees or oak trees uh, there, and the, and the caterpillars come down, and they collect them by the tens of thousands. So this is... Yeah, uh, Jeff Butner. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we had this, this 120,000 winter moth pupae being collected this year. Uh, so it's, it's a huge effort. Uh, it takes about six weeks. There's about 500 caterpillars in each one of those buckets. And um, then they're reared to the pupil stage and shipped to the quarantine lab down at Otis Air Base, where they have to, you have to screen them to make sure you're not bringing in anything else and overwinter it, and then the next spring we release them. So uh, for last year, it was, it, we had 28,000, not just last year, but the previous year, we had 28,000 flies that we released in various sites. You have to do this on a large scale. You can't release a few, I mean, everybody, I get phone calls, people wanting me, can you release flies in my yard? Well, <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> uh, because uh, you've got to do this on a large scale. You imagine you release a, you know, a few hundred flies. They fly off. Uh, who knows how far? And then they, they lay eggs and they go into, you know, and they come out again the next year. If they've flown too far, there's too few of them, they, they'll be unable to find mates and they go extinct. So you've got to do this on a great scale. That's why you have to do it on a big scale like this. We release at least between 1,500 and 2,000 flies in any one site. We had to do a few flights over the year. So we, we spread it over the landscape, but we've done that uh, uh, successfully over the landscape from coastal Maine to. Uh, to, um, uh, to coast Connecticut, we've released the flies. Uh, the, the, the fly symbol indicates the places where we have established the, established the flies. So we've established that 21 of 41 release sites. So this shows some of our earlier data. It takes a long time. And just like it did in Nova Scotia. I mean, for, we go for years. So each one, you know, each one of these is a year. And so the, the, the orange arrows show when we release it, and the blue arrows show when we get recovery. We always, it seems like we always get recovery, but it takes several years, from two to six years. Look at the one that went on. We released the first slide in 2006, 2007. The first recovery was in 2012. I mean, we, we, every year we go back to these sites, we collect 500 caterpillars. It's a huge under undertaking. And uh, we rear them out and it's like sect them in midsummer to find out what fraction of them have the fly inside them. And for years, it's nothing. So, but the flies are out there. Simply, you imagine in every, there's about, a, in the high density of the population, there's 100,000 caterpillars per tree. Uh, and we release a few hundred flies, or 2,000 flies, and they fly off, and, and, you know, they're out there. But with, with 100,000 caterpillars per tree, and one generation a year of the fly, and one generation a year of the winter moth, it takes, so that means that in any one, in any of your yards, there's probably about 10 million winter moth, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 100,000 per tree, so, uh, uh, so it, 
2005, the least in 10 million winter moths, it takes several years to catch up before you can even detect it. But always you detect it. So for, the, for all the sites where we released prior to 2012, we now have complete recovery. But sometimes it took five or six years. So that's the way it is. But, and slowly but surely, it's building up. So we had the first big success rate right here by here in Wildwood. We have flies. We released flies here in Auburndale Park in Newtondale in Newton, and we have recovery of that site. So we're getting the flies established. It just takes time. You've got to have patience for this project. So we have we did a big study here in, in we released flies in Centennial Park in Wellfleet, and that in 2014 we suddenly have evidence of these numbers indicate percent parasitism. So suddenly we're getting significant levels of parasitism over an area that's about uh, uh, you know two miles or a mile, mile and a half across. So we, next year we, we embarked on an ambitious effort putting out, uh, putting out uh, transex, extending 10 kilometers uh, in many different directions, six different directions. So the, the yellow number indicate the recovery of fly and the levels of parasitism. So to see the levels of parasitism are in the 40 to 50 to 30 percent range in well weight, and then they, then they taper off as you go out, out in different directions, including the rest of the new. I think that, that's the site right there in Auburndale Park. Newton is right there. So we've recovered the fly there. So that was 2015. So last year, some of you here were, were helping in this project. I huge volunteers. So anybody who wants to help out next year, we'll do it again. So we see in, in 2016, the fly has now spread over much of the landscape from, from beginning to end across the landscape in the, in the western suburbs of Boston. We have the fly established. So that's a big accomplishment. And the numbers are not very high here, you know, 3% or 1%, but they're, they're, they're steadily building up in the center, in the center of Wellwood. So we'll see what happens. But does, you know, okay, we're, we're establishing the planet successfully across the landscape. That's, that's, that's a given. But is it going to control winter moth density? That's not a given. We don't know yet. So we have some promising data from Wellwood. So this shows, uh, again, the Nova Scotia story on the top. And the parallel data from Wellesley, red line defoliation, and uh, blue line percent parasitism of size <coughs> so taken off. I mean, it kind of bounces up and down between 20 and 40 percent. Is that enough to control winter moth? Well, the winter moth density, this is pupae per square meter. So we're, we're measuring pupil densities dropping into tough square buckets at Centennial Ten Park and West. So the, the pupae that come down about 90 percent, uh, even though the, the percent parasitism only vary between about 15 and 40 percent. I mean, all things being equal, you'd expect a 40% parasitism to produce a 40% drop in density. But the thing is, not all things are never equal in this business because one, one source of mortality affects other sources of mortality. And James Rollins described that for me. He was a colleague at the University of Alberta and studied the winter moth success in Canada. And what he found was that um, as parasitism um, increased, so did pupil mortality. So we have this whole suite of pupil uh, agents of pupil mortality that are infesting, uh, feeding on winter moth when they're down on the ground. And he showed that somehow they're synergizing one another. High levels of par higher levels of parasitism as it took off in Nova Scotia also re uh, resulted in high levels of pupil mortality. So what's going on there? Well, um, maybe it's something similar to what we have with gypsy moth, where if you, if, in high levels of, of, of mortality, in high density populations, the, the, the generalist predators maybe have uh, densities too high for them to, to cause a lot of mortality, but if you knock the densities down at an order of magnitude or 90%, suddenly the pupil mortality, the mortality by the general predators will increase. So it's, 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 it requires a synergy of, of a mortality agents and understanding the impact of all these systems. So there's evidence for this in England. So in low density populations, the, the pupil predators, um, low density populations, the pupil predators will regulate the population. They say they believe in low density populations in England, it's the pupil mortality that keeps the population in check. Whereas in high density populations, so are over here, the, the mortality decreases with, with increasing density, so the pupil, the, the predators become saturated. There's only so many whim on a, a community of predators can eat. And so maybe that's a general feature of population systems. So um, maybe that's what's going on. I have a graduate student, Hannah Broadley, who's taking, uh, 
trying to get a handle on winter moth pu pupa mortality. We have experiments where we deploy winter moth pupae. We take them out and put them in the landscape, and, like we did with those burlaps of our land and gypsy moth, and measure the rates of predation. So she discovered 29 species of carabid beetles feeding in, uh, on, on, on in pitfall traps, and two species of shrews. She also discovered a pupal parasitoid. So there's a whole web of mortality agents that we must try to understand if we're going to get a handle on this system. So the data looks promising, but it's, it's no mean, mean the sure thing, but we, we, we hope and believe we're, good, we're about to repeat, repeat the Nova Scotia story. We'll just have to see. This takes time, it takes patience, and we keep at it. So, um, I mean, basically the idea, if we're going to measure the impact of these biophysical agents, we have to uh, account for all of the uh, other mortality agents in the system. And this is rarely achieved, but we are tending to do this. So, I won't tell you all the things we're doing, but we have uh, studies going on with uh, long-term data analyses of mortality and, uh, and survival and fecundity on, on different life stages uh, of these various spots around the landscape. My student, Hannah, is uh, doing studies of gypsum or wintermark pathogens, which we think are fairly minor in, in, in this system. A student I'm working with at, at Harvard, uh, at Arnold Arboretum, is looking at the importance of synchrony with bud burst and different tree species as a, as a, as a mortality occurred when they first hatch. We just published a paper on a larval mortality where we had avian predation, which we think is relatively insignificant. So you've got to put it all together if you're going to try and explain it, and that's not an easy thing to do. So we've established sites at 21 of uh, locations, including all 17 sites where we were released prior to 2012. We've released now 41 sites across the landscape. We'll keep, we'll keep at it. We're now collecting the balls and we're flies in Wellesley. We're no longer going to Vancouver Island, but that stage was something. And, uh, and will it convert Wintermoth to a non badge like it did in Nova Scotia? It looks promising in Wellesley, but we will have to see. But look, you're right on the doorstep here, and hopefully we'll be controlling your, your Wintermoth here. Uh, we certainly have the fly established, so we will soon find out. If you want to help volunteer on our, our collecting crew next May, give me a call. You can stop me an email. We can use it. We had 38 people. We had 10 crews of 38 people collecting winter moths. You got it. We collected, uh, I think it was 76,000 winter moths uh, from 115 sites, including those 60 sites in the Atlantic, over a two-week period. So it's a huge undertaking. And it's all over. It all ends abruptly, like the 24th of May, when the winter moths all drop out of the all out of the out of the, out of the canopy and go down the pupae. Lots of people have helped out. Various funding sources. I'll probably lose them. Given what happened on Tuesday, I'll probably use the USDA funding. And uh, that's it.